Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Shelley Epperly here. Today is Monday, February the 11th, 2019. It's 8 a.m., 8 p.m., excuse me, in New York, 5 p.m. in Los Angeles. <laughs> it's very early, right? <laughs> it's 1 a.m. in London. <laughs> Sydney, Australia is at 12 noon. Wherever you are in the world, thank you for tuning in to yet another episode of LOA Today, your daily dose of happy. And I'm happy to report that uh, we are here for another Q&A today. So if you're uh, tuning into the live stream and you've got questions you want Shelly and I to address, feel free to type them into the comment section and we will be happy to do that. Um, and in the meantime, we'll just be coming up with some questions of our own and sharing news about what's been going on and so forth. And I, I have to say, Shelly, that uh, Louise and I went down to New Jersey uh, over the weekend to visit her sister and niece and nephew and had a wonderful time. It was really good. Uh, but when we got back, um, we were so wiped out. I was so wiped out that I actually tried to do something I don't normally do. I took a nap, which I usually don't do very well. I don't wake up well from naps. Cindy Chavez and I had that. Yeah, I, just, I can totally relate. Cause I like don't that either. Too? I, yeah. 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 It's one of those things. And, and so I tried to do it and I woke up and I was just woozy. And so I go online at eight o'clock to do the show with Anne Marie and she's got a scratchy throat and we're thinking, no, this ain't happening tonight. We're, we're canceling for tonight. <laughs> so it's nice to be here on an 8 p.m. on Monday and feeling good after all that, you know? I mean, it was a great weekend. Right. It's just last night wasn't there. So tonight, I'm glad we're here. This is good. So that's how my weekend went. How'd your weekend go? <laughs> my weekend went pretty well. Um, we woke up to snow on Saturday, which in oh. the Pacific Northwest up here, we're used to rain and when it yeah. snows, everything kind of comes to a screeching halt. But, and then they predicted all this other snow and then it just, nothing's happened. And now it's not supposed yeah. to snow again until Monday. And it was supposed to snow all week long, you know, oh, how wow. the weather changed. But um, yeah, so it's just rainy and cold, but um, we had a pretty good weekend. So Saturday we just kind of, hung out at home and we ventured out a few times. And then um, Sunday, kind of the same thing. My daughter came over for a while. We went to this European bakery that was, it's just so yummy. They have amazing baklava and I got something mm. called a Napoleon and it was so yummy. Oh. <laughs> it's one of those, it's one of those things where you eat it and then you're just like, afterwards you're like, oh, I shouldn't have ate that, but it was just so good. <laughs> <laughs> That's what uh, my former co-host David Barkey used to call um, energy raising food. That's, that's where you eat the food yeah. and you're just so energized by it, right? Uh, yeah. yeah <laughs> or vibration good. raising food. That was the other phrase he used, vibration raising food. But uh, yeah, that's good. That's really yeah. good. I know. Well, whenever I say that, where I'm like, oh, I ate that and I shouldn't have. Marley, my son, always reminds me, um, mom, remember that food is whatever you say it is. So if you think it's bad, it's bad. And if you think it's good, it's good. I'm like, yep, you're right. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just eat that tiramisu then. <laughs> that, isn't that the dangerous thing? I mean, you, you learn about this law of attraction stuff. You learn about being a deliberate creator. You start spouting it. And when you have kids around, it just all comes, you know, shooting right back at you every single time. It's same yep. for spouses too. I mean, Louise and I are doing this kind of thing to ourselves and to each other all the time. It's like you can't get away yep. with anything anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> and, yep. you know, actually, before the podcast, we were talking about a subject that uh, we can't really talk about in detail, but there was a general context. And the context I thought was a good one. So I figured maybe we can start off as that being like the main subject and the main the main question to address first. And that is so much of the time, many of us try to help out on Facebook in the Law of Attraction groups. Um, answering questions, you know, people post, I'm having this problem, or I'm trying to do that, I don't know what to do, you know, that kind of thing. And so, you know, and a lot of people, you know, chime in, they try to be helpful, which is great. Um, but it also occurred to me, and you, you reinforced it in a comment you made just before the show, the person who is asking for the help has to be willing to accept that responsibility for their own change. And I think for the most part, most people are, but it's still a great point because there are a lot of people who treat law of attraction as if it's a magic wand and it's not anything that they're doing wrong. It's just somebody has to wave the magic wand so they can start getting the things that they want. Right. Isn't that the way a lot of right. people seem to treat it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the people that contacted me today, um, she's just, she just was like, you know, I've been doing these visualizations for weeks and nothing's happening. I don't understand. Like, why isn't this working? And I said, well, mm. It also depends on what you're doing all day, every day. Like you can, 
you can take 10 minutes out of your day and do visualizations and you know say i i gave an example and it had nothing to do with what she was i mean looking at i didn't really know what her you know wants and needs were or whatever but i just said just right. for an example if you, if you live in a house and you're you know visualizing your perfect house and you know you're you're walking through it and seeing all your new appliances and your fireplace and your deck and everything you want in the house. And then you just go through your day and complain about everything that's wrong with your house and you don't take care of it and you don't clean it and you don't, you know, you can, those are the things that you need to be doing. That's the, that's where the action comes in. You visualize what you want and then you take what you have and you make the absolute best out of it. So you take that house and you, vacuum and you paint if you can and you even if you can't get brand new furniture you can get nice used furniture and you can make a little altar or you know make a special little like if you really like cooking you can take any little tiny kitchen and make it into a gourmet kitchen if you if you put forth the effort you know and and use your resources and and so to me that's where the law of attraction really starts taking shape is when you take what you have and make the best of it instead of just complaining about everything because the universe is just going to give you back what you what you're putting out so you can put out you know that you have a tiny kitchen and you want to be a chef or you can put out i have a tiny kitchen but i'm still a chef and i'm still making the best of it and the universe will give you back and give you back more of what you're already focusing on so it's a very true point, and yeah, certainly that kind of action, that's often what they call inspired action, is a good kind of action to take. But it also occurs to me that's not the only way to go negative, if you will, to start complaining about how you know the kitchen isn't big enough or whatever. Probably the most predominant way to go negative after we put out a positive request of some kind is to do it without vocalizing it. And what I mean is, let's say, let, let's say you asked for, uh, you, you said, you want to attract a new house with a big kitchen, okay? And it hasn't shown up yet. Okay, so the new house hasn't shown up with the big kitchen. What have you talked about before then? Well, you may not, may have, you may have been talking about how small your current kitchen is, but you may have not been talking about it at all. Instead, you may have been stewing on it. You know, thinking to yourself, mm -hmm. oh, well, that's never gonna happen. You know, I never get what I asked for anyway. You know, and, and you're not saying any of this, you're just kind of thinking it subconsciously, like, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what I was thinking. You know, I'm, I'm trying to talk myself into something that doesn't work, and I, I should know better. And you know, it's, it's just it, the vibration of that is just wrong. It just doesn't work. You know, but yeah. I, I think we do that a lot. And I think we do it a lot more than we recognize. So even those of us who, who understand that you have to walk the walk, I think it's so easy for us to just miss how am I actually feeling about it if I'm even if I'm not talking about it. How am I actually mm -hmm. feeling? Because the feeling is the driver, right? Yes, most definitely. Yeah, and that driver, without that driver, you're not going to get anywhere. It's kind of like uh, expecting to uh, climb into the cab and get to the airport when there's nobody behind the steering wheel. It just doesn't work too well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, the other thing that uh, I ran into today was people who are... Um, uh, I'm looking for a polite, not polite, but a, a pleasant way to, to approach it instead of the negative way that people are approaching it. But I'll, I'll, I'll say it this way. There was somebody who posted something, and I won't repeat what the post was because there are going to be a lot of people who would take offense at the post. They just wouldn't like it. They wouldn't like the topic. And mm -hmm. I can understand why. I mean, it made total sense to me why somebody would not like the topic. But what was interesting to me is that all these people, and you could tell they were regular LOA contributors, people who are constantly you know, responding to the various posts and trying to help people out and so forth, were absolutely reaming this person out for what they posted. And it, I mean, as I'm, watch, I'm looking at this stuff, first of all, I didn't watch it very long because I didn't want to be focusing on the wrong stuff. But more than mm -hmm. that, it occurred to me, I wonder if they understand how much energy they're putting into this thing that they don't want. Once again, an example of how we put our attention on stuff that we don't want while trying to convince ourselves that we don't do that. I mean, I spend a large portion of my day. Now, I, I can honestly say there are times that I definitely do focus on stuff that I don't want. And I do it knowing full well what I'm doing. And I've actually gotten to the point now where I'm thinking, I really want to cut down on that. Um, but at least I'm doing it consciously. But there yeah. are also some things that we do 
unconsciously that we aren't even aware of, of being you know the person who's doing this thing and we believe that we are generally positive we believe that we're generally focused right you know focused on the things that we want and mm -hmm. because and, and then there's the other part that goes along with it many of us have been doing this long enough now that we we recognize all the the traps right so there are certain ways certain things that you don't want to word your sentences as you don't want to make it look like oh well yeah i set myself up for that one you know so we avoid even acknowledging in writing or in our conversation that we've been focusing on something that we don't want and yet we still focus on what we don't want and then things don't show up and deep down we wonder well jesus is this really working it's it i mean even as i'm saying this i'm saying well why are you even talking about this subject because this is the subject that you want to stay away from but but nevertheless there it is you know <laughs> well like so today um was it today i think it was this morning i posted I just think it's interesting. This is just because of, you know, my my son deals with depression and anxiety and he's been kind of in a low spot for a couple of weeks and we've been, you know, trying all these different ways to deal with it and stuff and and your advice was it last was it last week? I think it was last Monday when I was just really having a hard time deciding what to do with him because oh, yeah, of his yeah. We talked about Sudbury. His orchestra yeah, trip and all that. And I you and I I took your advice and discussed it with my husband and we decided that that was a really good way to go at it, you know, mm. just to put it in his court and anyways, um so I deal with that. My dad committed suicide when I was eight, so I, you know, was dealing with a, a depressed person at that point in my life, you know, and didn't really understand it, you know, but, um, and still don't really completely understand it because I'm a pretty positive person and I will let myself, you know, fall in a ditch every once in a while, but I get out pretty quickly, you know, and, and, um, I just think it's interesting when we talk about physical health, like if you came to me and said, Shelly, I see that you're losing weight, how are you doing it? It would be a totally normal conversation for me to tell you, you know, well, this is what I'm doing. This is how much I'm exercising. This is what I'm eating. This is my thought process. And it's been working for me. I hope it works for you. And, you know, or, you know, there's Weight Watchers, there's Jenny Craig, there's Adkins, there's Keto. There's like, you know, whatever. Right. It all works for somebody because they're all running strong, you know. So then there's our mental health and yeah. it just seems like there's a hush about depression and anxiety like we're not really supposed to talk about it because i'm not depressed i can't tell you how to deal with your depression or give you any sort of insight because i don't know how it feels so um i mean i guess it would be it would equate for a skinny person to tell a fat person how to lose weight or whatever. But like, I just, so I just put this post on, on Facebook this morning, just kind of putting that out there. Like, you know, our physical health, we can all talk about it. It's pretty open, you know, it's nothing, you know, I'm sure super skinny people and super fat people hear comments all day. Oh, sure. And probably all, they hear it in their own heads too. Right? It's probably both. Oh ones. yeah. Oh yeah, but you know they hear it going through Walmart or sure. on the street or what, whatever, you know? And I've been guilty of it because you see somebody like that and you're like, whoa, whether it's too skinny or too, too large, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the whole mental health thing, it's like you're not supposed to touch that. And I just think it's interesting how, how it's dealt with in society because we throw so many pills at it mm -hmm. i mean my son's on three medications right now when i know one natural medication that would take care of pretty much everything but it's illegal for him to do that yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. so so it's like you know it's just it's just like I don't know. I just put that out there and a couple people kind of like, like what you said, they kind of attacked me. Like, well, until you're living it, you know, you have no right to even talk about mental health. And it's like, we all have mental health. Mm -hmm. And I've seen proof of people that 
are, have depression and they get out of it in different ways. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And to me, depression is a lack of happiness in some way. And I think that there probably is definitely a, chem a brain chemistry thing that goes on there. But I also think that like addiction and depression, I think that they, a lot of that can be cured with learning how to be happy and learning to live your life on your terms instead of everyone else's terms. There, there's an interesting sense. thing about depression, uh, people who are suffering from depression. And I'm thinking in one case now, this is a particular case of somebody a number of years ago who asked me to, to coach him, to give him some coaching, who was dealing with um, chronic depression. Um, he was clinically diagnosed as depressed. Mm -hmm. And the conversations I had with him were interesting conversations. We we did, I think, like four or five sessions, something like that. And I I can't honestly say we made a lot of progress. We made a little progress, but he would make progress and then he'd backslide and he'd make progress and he'd backslide. So the the messages weren't totally getting through, I don't think. And I tried one experiment one with him kind of early on in the process that was I thought rather eye opening. I asked him, I, I would start every, every session with the emotional guidance scale, you know, the, the 22 point scale. And, and I'd show him the scale and I'd ask him, where are you on the scale? And he would say, well, I'm about here. Well, that particular day, he was toward the bottom of the scale. He was, he was like in the bottom third for sure. So he was not in a happy place at all. He wasn't totally in the depression range, but it was pretty close. And so I asked him, what does he want to feel now? What would you, what would you prefer as your feeling? And he couldn't give me an answer. He couldn't answer the question. And on the one occasion where he did try to answer it, the way he would try to answer it was, well, I don't want to feel depressed, which of course isn't what I was aiming for. I was aiming for what do you want to feel, not what don't you want to feel. And, and that was a fascinating thing. It, it was fascinating. It was a little heartbreaking too, but this was a guy who was showing me that in his depression, he really couldn't see outside the depression. That's all he could see. And in fact, mm -hmm. that kind of informed what I did with him for the remaining sessions that I worked with him, where I was trying to help him find what is the next step up? What's up from there? And I realized that probably part of this, there was some deep anger that, that he never really voiced. Um, he, was, he was seeing a psychiatrist, he was seeing a therapist. That was actually the third person in the triad, so to speak. And everybody was kind of pushing in the same direction. I could get that sense from what he was telling me. Uh, but when I would try to get him to imagine, can you feel what it's like to feel like in the revenge section or in the sector or in the anger sector or the fear sector, can you, can you imagine that? He could spit back to me, well, yeah, I, I know what that fear is. I, I recognize, I, I, I have felt anger, but he couldn't go any further than that. He couldn't voice what was at the, the root of his anger, what was the core of it, other than, well, it makes me depressed. In other words, all the answers were this kind of circularity that didn't actually go anywhere. And I, I think that kind of, that, that touches kind of on what you were talking about. It touches on the fact that when you're that depressed, you really are not in contact with what you want at all. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, maybe going for happy, maybe that's a little bit too far, but certainly going for anything that moves you off of that spot even if it moves you slightly, that, that's really what you got to go for. And it also ties back to what we talked about a moment ago. You've got to be willing to accept the responsibility for what you're feeling. And I could never get him to voice that kind of acceptance, which I thought mm -hmm. was also interesting. And, and yeah. I don't have enough psychology training to know exactly what the nuance is of that. But it made me wonder, is his inability to, to even identify what it is that he wanted a, a step up, is that tied into uh, a, a, an unwillingness or an inability or, or just a lack of knowing how to accept responsibility for what I'm feeling right now when, you're, when I'm in that really depressed state? Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, I only worked with him for about four sessions, so it's not like I had a whole lot of um, experience with him to go on, but the questions just kept coming to my mind. And, and yeah, I, I actually thought I had him at one point too. I mean, the, the second to last, or actually the last section, no, second to last session was just before he took this major trip. A, a friend had offered to take him to the tropics. Um, I think mm -hmm. it was actually in Mexico, but it was, it was a tropical area. It was a vacation. It was a getaway. They were going to do all this fun stuff and so forth. 
And so the task I gave him was, see if you can just make some notes every time you have something fun and just make a, write a paragraph about what was fun about it. And when he came back, I asked him what he did and he told me, I said, did you make any notes? No, no, I didn't make any notes. So that told me he really wasn't ready to take responsibility for what he was feeling. It's like, he, it's almost like he was trying to get somebody else to feel it for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, I don't, I don't remember what I was going to say, but it, it just, it's interesting in those situations, like what their, what their background is. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I've tried, I've coached a few people through some major stuff in their life and, and we went back to like, how, where does this come from? Like, why do you think you're not worthy? Or why do you think, you know, and I look at like my own son and, and when he was little, he would, he needed like um, downtime. Like he'd go to school all day and he'd come home and just like, he just needed to watch TV for like two hours. Like he yeah. just needed to de decompress because he'd been being good all day. Not that he was a bad kid or anything, but he was just, you know, doing everything he was supposed to do at school. You know, he was one of the most responsible kids in his class. And, you know, in kindergarten, he was the one that would take the other ones to the bathroom and make sure they got back because that beginning, beginnings of kindergarten, you know, sometimes they just take off on the playground because they don't right. know that there's rules or whatever, you know, and, and, and so he would come home and as he's aged, he's gotten more and more responsibility, especially with school, because mm -hmm. that's your job when you're a kid. Right, you know, right. I even took him, I even took him out of school in eighth grade, because it was just in middle school, he was getting to the point where, you know, there was part, I would drop him off in the morning and just wonder, God, is he even going to be here when I get back? Or is he just oh, going to no. take <laughs> off? Like, well, and not that I, not that he was voicing any of that, but I just knew he hated it there so mm. much. Yeah. You know, and it's and it's like right now he's a year and a couple months from being eighteen, and it's like there's so much that you can do when you're eighteen, but right now this is these are the things you need to do. You know, and right. it's just yeah. And and part of that I think is that is where his depression comes from because he. There's days that he doesn't have time to decompress. He's got homework and theater and orchestra and, you know, he wants to go hang out with his friends so he can't decompress during that, you know, because they're all, you know, talking and having a good time or whatever. So it's, right. so looking back, it, I, I've been kind of looking back with him for quite a while now, just going, you know, back then he was, he was this kid that needed this special stuff, but what brought it to this level where he's on these medications and he, you know, and so I've just thought about that. Like he just needs like this time that he can't always get, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's just, I don't really, as a parent, I don't know what to do with that. And I've just, you know, like today I told him, you know, because his doctor upped a couple of his doses, and I'm like, you know what, you can control those, like, obviously, don't go overdose, but you can, if you, if you're feeling okay, only taking the half a dose, or a third, of, or two-thirds of the dose, or whatever, don't take it all, just because she, you know, you're getting to an age where you need to take control of your, you know, mm -hmm. what's going on with you, and how you feel, you know, and he's like, yeah, I know, you know, and yeah. So, well, I mean, the good news is you you have at least some sense that that's good. You have some sense of where that's coming from. I mean, that that's always yeah. helpful. You know, just having some information is useful. That's good. I mean, that means that to to at least some extent you can be helpful to him. Um, I mean, I felt really bad. The guy I was working with was a professional. He was a a dentist actually, and had um, actually he was a specialist, but um, he'd had this long career. He had a successful practice. And the depression had gotten so bad, he had to close his practice and sell it off. I mean, you know, and then trying to get at the root of what this guy's problem was. I mean, like I said, he had a psychiatrist and a therapist who couldn't get to the root of it. I didn't, I wasn't going to hold out a lot of hope I was going to get there. You know, so that that's a case where you just feel helpless. Like, how do you help this guy when you can't even find where his block is? And he doesn't know. He has no way to, to, to tell you. Um, so... I mean, that's an extreme case. There aren't a lot of people who are in that, but there are, there are a fair number. And I think about those mm -hmm. people because 
ultimately, I mean, you're right. They got to get happier. Somehow, some way, they've got to decide, I don't want to stay in, here, in this place anymore. I want to get out. And that, that was actually the only admission I could get out of this guy. He didn't want to stay there. But even that, I couldn't get a firm commitment on. Interesting, right. isn't it? I couldn't even get a firm commitment on that. Like, yeah, he wanted to get out of it, but a moment later, he'd be backtracking on it. It was really something. Yeah, the, cu really something. the couple of people that I've been helping out, you know, just via private message or something, you know, people like one today or one yesterday was, she just sounded pretty desperate. And I said, you know, if you want to PM me, because I don't like, you know, like sharing everybody's stuff, you know, with everybody or whatever. And sure. so she PM'd me and, and, and I just been like, when people are in that state, like in the moment and they're just like, I don't know what to do. I'm just desperate. My life is falling apart as we speak. I don't, I'm just like, what feels best right now? Like, yeah. what could you do right in this moment to just feel a tiny bit better? Is it, Stop and take a drink of water. Is it just walk out the door and go for a walk for an hour? Is it, you know, watch TV? Is it crochet? You know, I don't know. Yeah. You know, everybody, yeah. everybody, everybody's thing is different. And she, and she said, just talking to you is making me feel better. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. And it was just like, she goes, I'm normally not like this. I'm literally having like a meltdown. And I said, mm. I totally get it. Because over the weekend, I had a meltdown about my, my reselling business, you know, oh, and my husband. Yeah. And me and my husband have gotten really good where we get into those places and we don't blame each other. Where years ago, we would just attack each other. You're not doing this and you're not, you know, and now we kind of like, okay, I know I'm totally you know, being ridiculous right now, but I just need to like throw all this stuff out at you. And, you know, and he was just like, okay, well, you know, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I want to call Goodwill and have him come pick all this crap up. And <laughs> <laughs> He's like, well, you know, you know, you're, and I go, I know I'm not going to do that. It's just like, that's what would, you know, be really that's great in this book, you know, and then, and then, so that, you know, that, I that's where Louis and I are in that kind of, Louis and I are in that kind of conversation, and we don't have that one a lot, but we have had that one before. Yeah. And one of, we don't even do the same kind of business you do, but let's say we did that kind of business. If one of us said we wanted to take all the stuff to Goodwill, the other one would hand us the phone and say, okay, here you go. Are you ready? <laughs> oh, well, I guess not. <laughs> Just to get a laugh out of it. I, I didn't even have to get to that because I was like, I know <laughs> I'm not going to do that, but I'm just like, that's what feels really good right now. Okay. And it just came down to the fact that I just have all this stagnant stuff and I just have to take the time to go through it. So that's what I'm doing now. That's part of my day now is just going through it and getting rid of all the stuff that's just been sitting there for sometimes some, some of the stuff I've had for years, literally, oh, wow. you know, that hasn't sold. And it's just because I just keep adding more because that's what you do. You just keep buying more stuff to sell. But anyways, it's just felt really good to purge that and to kind of start new and went to the yeah. thrift store today. So it was all good, but I totally understand where that, where that's coming from, because even though I have a pretty darn happy life and I'm good with, you know, all the pillars of my life or whatever, for the most part, I still just fall apart. I mean, you know, I, a, a gal that I coach, pretty regularly over the years, we were friends back in Klamath Falls. And, um, you know, I told her, yeah, it was one of those days where I just went to Safeway and bought a bunch of their, their Chinese food, which, you know, isn't very good. <laughs> but, you know, I, I just like went and bought all this yummy food that isn't good for you. And I sat and watched, you know, Real Housewives of whatever for like five hours. I said, that was what my day was because I just didn't want to go anywhere or do anything because I was just in a really low place. And it, I just knew that I needed that space. And, and she was just like, you do that? And it's like, yeah, I do that. Like, nobody's, you know, I'm sure Tony Robbins has days where he's just like, I'm just going to stay in and eat food. And, you know, sure. I mean, I, I don't know if there's very many because he seems like he's pretty motivated. But, you know, I mean, I'm. I'm a wife. I'm a mom. I'm not, you know, do it. But anyways, um, I just think it's interesting to kind of like dig up what people's stuff is. Like, 
you know, we were talking about, we've talked about blocks before, you know, like mm -hmm. stuff happens to you when you're a kid that you don't even know, or a baby that you don't even know that's just been drilled into your head. And that's why yes. you, you know, don't have enough money or you can't find a good job or you can't find a good spouse. You know, if you heard your mom talking about how all men are cheats and liars your whole life, you're going to keep affirming that with your relationships, you know? Which so, means we have a lot, we have a lot of things that we can work on if we choose to. I mean, and that can actually yeah. be a little bit overwhelming, but there's plenty, there's not like we lack material. We have plenty of material to work on. Um, so yeah, if we can identify, like taking your example there, if we can identify that we kept getting a message that, you know, all men are cheats, well, we can decide, okay, maybe I'll turn that one around. Maybe I'll, I'll decide to say that all the men that I meet are fantastic. All the men I meet are loyal, they're committed, they're, 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 they're wonderful. Or I can stick with all men are cheats. It's up to me. And that's where the beauty is. We get to choose. But I think on a personal level, it's good for you to dig that up for yourself to mm. find out that it really wasn't yours to begin with. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it makes it easier to let go of it when you know it's not yours. I did that with my finances and figured out, you know, where the, where my financial blocks were coming from, from my parents as, mm -hmm. a, as a baby you know, yeah. and, and growing up and stuff. And it was like, oh, okay. So that, that's not me. That's just what I learned at a very exactly. early age. You know? So just being conscious of that makes you start to switch gears. Cause you exactly. know, you know, there's lots of people that make lots of money and are responsible for lots of money and they enjoy it, you know? And, you know, there's lots of people that have been in committed relationships for decades and decades and they're so good for each other and they've never mm. cheated and they've never lied you know well maybe they've lied a little you know <laughs> <laughs> you got to tell her when she looks nice in the dress whether she does or not right <laughs> <laughs> well, actually i think what you really need to do is you need to know her or him whichever it might be you, you need to know your yeah. partner and know what the partner needs at that particular time because it's going to be different for every person but uh, you're right. Usually you can't go wrong saying that's a wonderful looking dress. That, that's usually a fairly safe thing to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but you're right about how we have all this, this stuff that we pick up from our parents. And, and you're right about it being financial, too, because I have that. Um, my, my parents grew up in the Great Depression. And mm -hmm. anyone who has parents who grew up in the Great Depression knows what I'm talking about when I say you are taught how to be poor. You are taught how to be frugal is a nice way of saying it. You are, you are taught to be thrifty and to look for the cheapest price and to save everything and to not throw anything out. You, you learn all this stuff. So yeah. understanding that, recognizing it becomes helpful. Not so much, I mean, it's great if you can get rid of it all at once. You know, just say, okay, that's, that's not my block. It's gone and now you're done with it. But what I found happens is it tends to crop up periodically. So I'm going along and all of a sudden I find myself in that fear-based mode of, you know, I got to hold on to pennies and everything. And if I can remember that this is what I learned from my father primarily and my mother to a lesser extent, if I can remember that, then I can also remember, well, I have successfully let go of that kind of thing in the past, so I can let go of that now. And in so doing, mm -hmm. I can give myself another rest and another, another bit of release to, to let go yeah. of that thing. So I, I find it's more of an ongoing thing. It's not, it's not something to wrestle with. It's just, uh, you know, it tends to, to just come back every once in a while. And when it comes back, I have to remind myself, oh, that, that's not me. That's just this, this thing that I picked up yeah. from my parents and I just have to let go of that. Yeah, I totally understand what you're saying. It's like you fall back a couple of steps and you gotta go, yeah. oh yeah, I was up, I'm up there. I'm not back here. <laughs> right, yes, exactly, yeah. <laughs> And look at all the progress I've made over the years. I mean, because there was a time where I would have allowed that to drag me down yeah. for days, weeks, months at a time. I mean, yeah, it can really do a number on you, to say the least. I think it is. I think Jenny is, is your friend, isn't she? she? She's commenting like yeah, crazy. Yeah. 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 She, she's throwing up all these very. Some of them are very good comments, but she she is just contributing like crazy here. I think people have a hard time with the word responsibility. I don't think they have trouble with the, with the word. They have trouble exercising and acting on responsibility. I mean, I, I find most right. people will actually say, yeah, I'm, I, I'm willing to be responsible for my own behavior. 
and then they make a lie of it by not doing it. <laughs> yeah. They have no problem saying I take responsibility. It's kind of like a politician says, I take responsibility for it. That's the end of it. You know? There's no actual responsibility going on. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. <laughs> Politics just makes me sad because I feel like it takes some really great people and just ruins them with all the just even even starting out with the campaigning, you know. You know what? One of the best things you can do is you can keep track of people who retire from politics because then you can have something to celebrate. They left it behind. Yeah. Right. You know that's somebody who's. For whatever reason, think, they, maybe they didn't do it consciously, but at least they, they moved away from that realm where everything is wrong, where everything is bad, where everything I, is a, a catastrophe. I think in that, there are people that are in politics for all the right reasons. It's like, oh, sure. we put out that, that generally politics is just a bunch of garbage, but but it does serve a good purpose, and it does, and there are people that go into it for the right reasons and stay in it for the right reasons and stay true so mm -hmm. yeah no it's true um and yet i also know like I, I saw an ad no it wasn't an ad it was an article about PETA. and i can't remember what PETA stands for but it's basically pets it's it's, it's animals it's animal protection uh, it's it's um people for the ethical treatment of animals ethical treatment of animals that's it yeah and PETA yeah. apparently is doing a protest at I think it's Madison Square Garden where there is a, a dog show going on purebred dog show where you know they um running obstacle courses and all that kind of stuff and mm -hmm. they were going to I don't want to even say exactly what they're going to do because it was pretty disgusting but they're going to basically play up all of the animals who get euthanized at shelters by dumping all these dead animals that, that's as much as I'll say about it and I, I I'm looking at the article and I'm thinking to myself these are people who are on the right track, their heart's in the right place, they're absolutely on the right side of things, and they're completely blowing it because they're, they're focusing in, exactly on what they don't want. <laughs> they're like in desperation to make yeah. people see their point instead mm -hmm. of coming up with, like to me, if you were gonna do that, like maybe fund some more shelters or something, you know, I don't know, like, I know there's lots of shelters or whatever, but yeah, that's just, that's too bad. Yeah, it, it, it's a sad thing. I mean, because they could have taken their, their time to uh, simply say, adopt more animals. Let's, let's, let's find for more homes for animals or let's, or let's. Even, uh, or even set up an adoption, an, an adoption event at the dog at, show. At the event. Yeah, right. Something yeah. on that line. Or, or, or maybe something that encourages people to get animals fixed. You know, something that, had, that takes on a positive tone. But instead, they took on this really negative tone, and it occurred to me, that, and apparently they did this last year as well for the same event. And the, the, the question I wanted to ask is, well, how did it work last year? Because I know what the answer is. I mean, we know as law of attraction practitioners exactly what the answer is. The answer is nothing improved, and it probably got worse, you know? Yeah. And yet they don't seem to see that. That, that, that is, that's where the real sad part is. So that's why I say when somebody gets away from politics, even if it's just retiring from politics, their lives are improving because they're mm -hmm. getting, even if it's just small steps, they're, they're distancing themselves from that realm of finding fault with everything, of finding that, you know, everything is something to be afraid of or something to, you know, turn into a catastrophe or big red flags and all this horrible stuff going on. Everything in the world is falling apart. The sky is falling, chicken little, you know, all that kind of stuff. Get anything yeah. you can get a, do to get away from that is a good thing. So that's where I look at what what people are getting away. How are people leaving that behind? A lot of people. I'm really pleased to hear this. A lot of mm -hmm. people have given up watching the news, and I'm really oh, yeah. impressed by that. I mean, that, that's wonderful. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I I think that if you're gonna if you're gonna work the law of attraction to your benefit at any level that should be one of the top things that you do in your life is to turn off the news period. Mm -hmm. like, there's, mm -hmm. like there, my brother-in-law lived with us for a while, for a while when we lived in Klamath and um, every morning you'd go in the living room and turn on the news, you know, CNN or Fox, mm -hmm. or I don't even know. I mean, you know, I, I would just like totally ignore it. But I just thought, yeah. how can you eat? Like, how can you even, Start your day 
listening to that negative drone of every, and I, you know, like a couple times I have turned it on here because like, you know, a snow day or something, you're looking at, you know, is your school going to go across the ticker or you, you know, what's going on with the, there's been, you know, like when there's like a school thing, like a lockdown in the school, I'll turn on the news, see what's going on with that or some, you know, and, and, uh, but it's just like, you know, this happened and there was a carjacking and there was a high speed chase and this politician did this and these protesters are in front of the mayor's house and the, and the, you know, but you know, this and that, and, you know, and every once in a while they have a little feel good story about something that happened and somebody that saved somebody from a house fire or a dog that, you know, got somebody across the street or whatever, you know, which is great. I love that they are trying to throw that in there, but, oh man, it's like, it would be so nice to just have like a whole network a whole television network that was just all about the good stuff in life. Mm. Good food, good people, good stories, good travel, good mm -hmm. Samaritans, you know. Yeah. That, that's the news I would watch. But I just think that if you are watching the news every day and you are trying to better your life, you it's like a detriment to your, your mental health. <laughs> totally. I, mean, I can think of somebody who I won't name, who I had a conversation with in the past week, who was very proudly telling me how she reads the New York Times every day, cover to cover, because she believes that a well-informed citizenry requires people knowing everything about what's going on. And she's very proud of herself for that. Um, and, and I think it's important to understand that it isn't necessarily that you need to get away from the news. I mean, I would say in most cases we do need to get away from news, but it depends on what your state of mind is. If watching or reading the news starts to bring you down, then stop reading the news or watching the news long enough to either stay away from it or change your perspective about how you're going to view it. Because she views it in a way that doesn't tear her apart. And right. that is possible to do, you know. I, I, there are oh, certain yeah. things in the news I watch regularly. I don't watch newscasts, but I'll read articles um, online at the various major media pub publications on certain topics. And, and they're invariably mm -hmm. related to politics of, a, of one particular area of politics because I'm a political scientist. That was my training in, in college. So mm -hmm. I, have, I have this, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, a sick interest in a sense, but I have this interest because I, I, I find the whole political process to be fascinating. Nevertheless, I also know where my limits are. Um, Cindy Chavez and I had a, top, a conversation about this topic uh, about a week ago, two weeks ago, and uh, she asked me, you know, how much time do I spend on the news? Like, what's the longest period of time I'll spend on the news um, in a given day? And I told her a maximum of like 15 minutes. And she said, 15 minutes, how can you last that long? <laughs> 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 that anything more than two or three minutes is far too long. You know, so it's going to be different for every person. Um, but even with 15 minutes, again, it comes down to how am I feeling as I'm doing it. If I'm reading stuff and it's starting to feel, you know, to weigh me down and I'm only two minutes in, I'll just turn it off because yeah. I'm monitoring what's going on inside. I'm monitoring how I'm reacting. If on the other yeah. hand, I'm reacting in a way that, I'm still feeling good or I'm laughing at it. That's one of my favorite things to do is to laugh at some of the stuff that's out there. And if it's actually helping me feel good, well, I will, I will often stay with it in part because I'm, I'm trying to toughen up my boundary about being brought down by what I'm reading and you know just separate that event from what's going on in my head and not allow that to, to control my programming, so to speak. Um, but if I find right. that it's it's dragging me down the other way, then like, nope, got to stop, got to get away from this right now. And actually, lately, I've been coming to the conclusion, I need to get, a, I need to reduce the time a bit. It is, it's becoming a little bit too much for me. I, I, there have been times when I've been feeling it. Um, I've even talked yeah. about it here on the program a couple of times. There were like two weekends in a row where I had a really, really rough day. And, and as I thought about it, I realized it's very likely that I've been watching, I've, I've been kind of overdosing on, on news and politics. And I just need to cut back on that so it doesn't, you know, program me. Me as much as I had been doing. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it isn't necessarily that you have to abandon it entirely, but if you find that it's bringing you down at all, turn it off. Stop it. Shut it off. Yeah. Well, like, 
in the secret they talk about the news a little bit and james ray says it you know it you know because people are like well i need to be informed yeah you can be informed without being inundated is yeah, exactly, exactly. you know yes. it's, you know you can open up the paper or turn on the news really quick to find out what the weather's going to be or what your sports team right. did or what is going on with your favorite even your favorite candidate in the in the election it doesn't mm -hmm. take hours to find that out it's exactly like literally, like literally you can pick up your phone and figure that out now and, yeah. and, and oh, yeah. have that in seconds and then turn it off and move on with your life and yes. and yeah so you know like thinking about my husband because we get the paper and and uh he'll you know he he likes sports so he reads the sports you know mm -hmm. and he He'll touch on the other stuff and you know see what's going on in the community which i appreciate because i'm totally not into it so he'll be like <laughs> you know, he'll, come, he'll be like oh you know how they had that bridge closed it's because they're doing blah 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 and i'll be like oh okay or you know they're gonna open up the road here they're not gonna have that intersection anymore oh okay that'll be nice to just go straight through on that you know so it's right. been really interesting to you know and like stores like He'll he'll say, oh that that building that used to be the Safeway is going to be a big lots now, and I'm like, oh you know, so I get my news from the, like that's how I get my news is from my husband reading the paper. Mm, yes, right, yeah, that's true, that's good, and and the what what we're really talking about here is we're talking about learning how to control your own thought process regardless of what you're doing, because mm -hmm. I mean Abraham makes a good point, even if you run away from something. You're still taking yourself there, so to wherever that new place is that you're going. So if you if you have this tendency to get dragged down by news in this case, well, you can avoid watching news all you want to, but other kinds of news are going to creep into your life. Is that going to bring you down? You know, you, you've got to, at some point you got to address. I'm not going to allow that thought process to become my thought process. I'm going to choose my own thought process that's different from what I'm seeing there because I don't like what that one is. I like this one instead, the one that I that I'm focusing on. Yeah, and that's a good skill to develop. That that I think that's how you get that that strong mind, you know, that 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 willpower, or as people sometimes call it, the the ability to focus intently on what it is that you really want. You have to kind of practice. You have to kind of push yourself and, and test your strength in some ways. Not not well, that, the point where you're where you're in harm, but you know. That's like the simplicity of the law of attraction. Like I've been noticing lately when I've been helping people, and they're like, you know, I really want to find my twin flame or my soulmate, or I really mm -hmm. want it. I really want to get my finances together. The first step in any of that is to love whatever it is you want. So yes. if, you want someone, if you want someone to love you, you have to love you. So how I put it with the whole, with the whole, I really want a man in my life, or I really want a woman, you know, I really want a soulmate or whatever. I, my perfect thing that I say to people now is, you have to love yourself enough that when that other person comes into your life, they are there to complement your life, not to complete your life. Yes. And you I are so completely. happy. And you're so happy with yourself that if they are not the person to complement your life, you have no problem letting them fall out of your life. Because I see so many people that are just so desperate to have somebody love them that they will change their whole personality and then that gets resentful after a while because that Absolutely. person's not that person's not giving back because you're molding yourself to what they what they want and then you're like but i need i have needs too but they don't know what your needs are because you've been you know putting on this act for a while it's like i you know and i know that there's different and then, and then that's where it comes where you have to dig up why do you feel like you have to change your personality to make somebody happy you know and why are you so desperate for that you know and um even as a teenager like i broke up with a couple boyfriends you know throughout my high high school and and you know into my early 20s because it just wasn't serving me i was i don't know what happened to me in my life i think part of it was that my mom was a single mom and she always put us first and she had several boyfriends and she was not a very good person she wasn't a very good picker of men in her life and she'll admit that and and but no matter what she always put us first so mm -hmm. if there was you know 
I mean, I remember when I was like 15 and she had this boyfriend and she had to leave town because one of her uncles was passing away and she went with my grandma and my aunts and, you know, I'm 15, my brother's 14, she just left us at home. Well, this guy had just kind of moved into the house and he like came home and he's drunk and he's telling me, you know, I really care about you and I really love your mom, but you and your brother better not come between me and your mom. Oh, lovely. And, and like, like literally that evening she called and, you know, cause she was just calling was way before cell phones and all that back in the eighties. And she right. called just to see how we were doing. And I told her what happened and she's just like, he'll be gone when I get home. Don't worry about it. Just stay out of his way until I get there. I'll be home in a couple of days. And, and, ex and that's how it was. Like she didn't, she didn't, there was no question in her mind right then. This guy is gone. Like you don't treat my kids that way. You know, and we hadn't done anything, you know. Like, right, right. Anything. But anyways, like, that's just an example. And I think just because that, because of that, and, you know, I, I just always knew that I was someone special and I always knew I was loved. And I've just, like, you know, my husband's, you know, he's always said, you know, if you don't like something, you stop doing it. Like, I wish I had that because I just keep doing things because I think I have to, you know. And, and so, um yeah, it's just been an interesting journey to to know that I've actually been, you know, of course, using the law of attraction all these years oh, sure. to, get, to get what I want. You know, like I was telling you about my, you know, having a boyfriend and my current husband was a friend of his. And I was like, I, right. like that. I like that guy more. And I yeah. kicked that other guy to the curb. And then, you know, within a couple of weeks, I was with Scott. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and that happened a couple of times with boyfriends before that, where I would like see him and be like, oh, he's really cute. And then a couple of weeks later, we're in the same place at the same time. And then, you know, we got together and, you know, had a little relationship and then it no longer served me and I break up with him. You know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't really, I didn't really ever experience true heartache because I was the one that broke the hearts because I didn't want to be in it anymore. So mm -hmm. it's, so I think because of that, it's really easy for me to say that, like, well, don't, don't be with somebody to complete you. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that, that just doesn't even seem right to me. And I know that's the way to be. So it's hard for me to understand the other side of that, where you have these people that are just desperate to be with someone and they just give up everything to be with someone. And then they don't understand why they're not getting anything back. You know? Very true. I loved what you said earlier about, people who are, I think you've described it, they were looking for their twin flame or their soulmate or whatever, and they're the ones who are trying to mold themselves to their partner, to, mm -hmm. to be who they want the partner to be, which is really a bad strategy. It's a strategy that always backfires. Um, yeah. But, but and it always leads to the worst possible consequences that you could expect. Uh, but the other thing that's really um, noteworthy, in my opinion, about that particular approach is, let's say you, you somehow, manage for some split second in time to mold yourself into exactly that perfect person that the other person wants to be then what do you do with your life because you're no longer you mm -hmm. so, so what happens at that point and they never think about that all they think about is all i have to do is get to the point where i have fit myself into this one particular mold so that he'll like this person because that's the person he's looking for and i'm going to be that person they don't think beyond that they just think, oh, it's all going to be happily ever after. But how can it be? Because you can't be you anymore. How do you do that? You can't. There's just no way. And that, and so it falls apart. It has to. Yeah. So I just, I just say that like a broken record. You know, you have to love yourself enough that whoever comes into your life compliments your life instead of completes your life. And I think that's true with friendships and family member relationships, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. of course, there's Thanksgiving and Christmas or what, you know, whatever, there's different family gatherings where you, you know, have to be around, you know, Aunt Judy and you can't stand her or whatever, you know, <laughs> and you just tolerate it for the hour or two, you have to do it or whatever. And that's fine. I mean, everybody, everybody learns to ha how to be tolerant of people for a certain period of time, but, but you know, there's, there's really toxic relationships that are, that are platonic relationships too. You know, there's a lot of people that will use you and, 
and you know parents and children get into that too you know where in, in both in both ways you know there's parents that told you know i i know you know some of the you know watching some of my daughter's friends you know some of the parents that are just like hanging on to their kids for dear life oh, and, their yeah. kids, and their kids are like i want to go explore you know and they you know some of them stay and tolerate that for years and some of them just leave as soon as they can and then vice versa there's there's kids that just cling on to their parents and you got the 40 year old living in the basement, you know, and, and so it's and just, they, a, and they usually work together. It's not like it's usually just one or the other. Oh, they yeah. usually combine oh, yeah. together. Yeah. In fact, uh, that, that pattern, the first one you described of the parent who is trying to get the kid to mold himself to what the parent wants. And even perhaps occasionally, you know, meeting that, that ridiculous criteria for a split seconds at a time. That parent is never satisfied. There is nothing that child can do to satisfy the parent. You can't point that out to the parent because if you do, they'll just deny it. But when you watch the scenario, the, the kid can never win. There are no circumstances under which the kid is doing it well enough because if he happens to actually reach the point where for that split second of time, he's doing it perfectly, does he get any credit for that? No, he just gets the credit of not being blamed anymore. Yeah. So he still can't win. <laughs> there is no way to win. <laughs> and I think that there's parents out there that they've identified their so I, I see this a lot in moms, you know, where like so my kids, I'm I'm approaching empty nest and you know, I look at pictures of them when they were little and I'm like, Oh, you know, I posted some on Facebook today, you know, when yeah. they were little and stuff and I'm just like, Oh, I just I miss those little people, you know, but then <laughs> You know, people will be like, oh, aren't you so sad that they're moving out or they're moving? Like, I enjoy all these phases. Yeah, I miss those phases, but I'm looking so forward to like going over, you know, like last night we went over to Madison's house, you know, mm -hmm. which is my, our daughter. And it's like, I'm looking so forward to more of that, you know, and, and, and it just being Scott and I, and, you know, us just getting to know each other. It's, it's like, there's moms out there, and I, there, I'm, I know there's dads too, because one of the kids that I'm talking about, it's definitely the dad that's like hanging on for dear life. But, but it's like a lot of moms they've identified as a mom for so long, and then when their kids leave, they don't know what to do because they haven't been living their life. Yes. They've been, they've been taxiing kids and running around and being the the booster mom and the PTA mom and and then their kids leave and a lot of times those kids leave as fast and as quick you know as soon as they possibly can because they feel a little stifled and then the parents are just devastated because they're you know don't, don't they love me don't they appreciate what I did for them it's like yeah they do but the, you know they're they're flying out of the nest now, you know, like this was the whole goal. Right. <laughs> All these years. I love the way you said it. You know, they, they, they're, I, what, I don't think you actually said the sentence, but what it added up to was their identity was being mom or dad. That was their entire identity. They hadn't built their own lives. I mean, the good news yeah. is that at any given time, we can change tracks. That That's the really great part. Yeah. So even if we've been stuck in that kind of a dysfunctional relationship for years and years on end, at any given moment, all we have to do is make the decision, I'm not going to be that way anymore. I am going yeah. to become who I am. And I'm not going to get, stay stuck in that codependent dysfunctional situation that I've been in. And and that's a beautiful thing because when we make that decision and, and make it enough that we can stick to it for at least some seconds at a time, and then minutes at a time, and then hours at a time, life gets better. Life gets a whole lot better. So that's the beauty of it. The beauty is there's always hope. The hope is always there because we do have the power at all times. And I, yeah, I like to remember we, that. We always have choices, always. Yeah, that, that's very, very reassuring. It, it gives me hope for the world. Despite all the craziness that goes on, I feel better <laughs> about the world than ever before. I really do. I mean, I- Yeah, I, me I, too. And I used to be a real downer on the world, but no more. That, that you know, life is still good. Life is still good. So, yeah. Well, we didn't good. we we didn't really go with uh, any uh, uh, questions from the live stream audience, but we came up with some good topics ourselves. So congratulations to us for coming up with some good stuff to talk yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was good. So, <laughs> so I will see you next week, unless you're dropping in one of the other uh, 
live streams this week, which is always possible with you. I never know when I'm going to see you, but uh, if I... I know. I, I need... I, I almost feel obligated that I need to do it. <laughs> well, don't feel obligated. Do to... it because you want to. Do it because you enjoy it. That's the only reason it's fine. When is, when is Joel on? What, Thursday what's morning. What's his time? Thursday, Thursday morning. That's, morning. That's pretty low, pretty early for you. That's 5 a.m. your time, 5 to 6 your your time. Yeah, but I might be, able, it's 5, but I I won't come on video because I have it. Um, That's that right, he early. doesn't either. So I could just come on audio maybe. So I'll, maybe I'll try to do that because I would really like to talk to him about what's going on with sure. my kiddo. Yeah, he's like I, that. I, I did try to contact him through his website, but I never heard anything back. So, oh really? Um, oh, okay. Yeah. He had, he had a form you filled out. Is that what you did? Yeah, it was like a little form okay. to you know your email and phone number and somebody get back to you. But okay. unless they're just not leaving messages, I didn't see an email. So I'll, I'll I'll let him know. I mean, it's always possible. I know he was having trouble with his website at one point, so it's possible the form just isn't working properly. But I'll let him know that that happened. But yeah, come on, talk to him that day. That'll be great. Okay. So when it, whenever it is, I see you next time. I will see you that next time, whatever it is. <laughs> okay, sounds good. And we'll say the same thing to our listeners. We'll see you else as well next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.